A bit of background on my family situation. I first noticed my symptoms when I was 30. At that time I knew that some of my uncles, who were four of my mother's nine brothers, uh, had this disease that no one knew what it was. As a youngster I was aware of these fragile old gentlemen. No one knew what they had. They lived all around Australia and we had a range of names put in front of us um, until eventually they died. Um, over the next 10 or 20 years I did some personal research. Um, I had nerve conductivity tests, I had muscle biopsies, I had bits poked, I had a range of things done and in the late 80s I was given a definitive um, uh, diagnosis of adult onset spinal muscular atrophy uh, and told there was nothing that anyone could do about it. So I could say to people, I've got SMA, but there's nothing that could happen. Um, my eureka moment came in the mid 90s when I was listening to the radio in the car, a medical program, and a researcher, Professor Jeffrey Zajac, uh, was talking about a disease. Uh, and I thought, hey, I've got that. And paradoxically, Jeff lived and worked in Melbourne, and I lived and worked in Melbourne, so it was easy to get in contact, have, get the DNA test done, and I discovered that I had Kennedy's. So I could then say to people, great, I've got Kennedy's disease, but again, there's nothing anyone can do about it. This is my mother's, the family tree, my mother's uh, 12 siblings. We had big families in Australia in those days. My brother, my father had, there were 11 in my father's family too, so as a little kid I had lots of cousins to play with. There were cousins everywhere. Christmas is the time Australians get together, and Christmas was a ball because there was all these kids playing. Uh, in my mother's family, uh, I put a star on the sufferers, uh, I put a little triangle on the he gets my Y. It goes, it goes to Kelly, and she would normally have a 50-50 chance to pass that to any naturally uh, conceived children. Kelly had DNA testing to confirm that she was a carrier, uh, so that she could do something about it. I note that in the U.S., uh, people are reluctant to have. Uh, early diagnosis because of insurance problems. Uh, I think that's a great shame because it starts to, by having a diagnosis late, uh, it eliminates early family planning options that are available. Um, yes, it's probably, apart from the res young researchers up the back, uh, it's been part of our lives because we're all more than 40 years old. 40 years ago it was fairly unconventional, there was lots of ethics committees worrying about it, there was lots of public opinion about it. People said people were playing God and things like that and the babies born would have no soul. The first IVF child in Australia, the first test year baby, she's called in, um, was born in June 1980, she turned 30 this year. Uh, and she certainly dispelled any thoughts about souls, children. Um, IVF is the process by which human egg cells are fertilised by sperm outside the womb. It's a major treatment for infertility. Uh, when other methods of assisted reproductive technology fail. The process involves hormonally controlling ovulation, <coughs> removing the eggs from the woman's ovaries, letting sperm fertilize them in a fluid material, and transferring the fertilized eggs back to the woman, hoping that the pregnancy will occur. Over, over recent years in Australia, and perhaps in the US, the age of first-time mothers has increased. 
Our youngsters are too busy establishing themselves in, in their jobs. They're too busy having fun and first time mothers are, are putting off having children until their mid to late thirties. Unfortunately by then they're much less fertile than their younger sisters. And we find a lot of Australian women are having to resort, resort to IVF um, when other reproductive technology fails. The theory behind it is that embryos created by IVF can be tested for genetic abnormalities or chromosome abnormalities so that only those patients without conditions are implanted. Initially PGD, PGD was used in the late 90s for selecting female embryos uh, at patients at risk of X-linked diseases. By only implanting females, they eliminated the sufferers, but they didn't eliminate the spread of the disease because the females were carriers, so it just postponed the outcome. More recently, uh, it's been expanded to look at the genetic health of each embryo uh, and clear male or female embryos can be implanted. I, I, no, I did a Google search of PGD uh, and there are a lot of clinics around the world and in the US that offer the service. Uh, I found 60 conditions uh, that it's authorised uh, to be used for. And going down those, I didn't recognise very many. And I thought that there are probably a lot of other diseases out there, like Kenley's, where the only people who know about it are the sufferers, the carers, the families and the researchers. I, I, I just wanted to illustrate the fine needle technology where cells are removed uh, from embryos for testing. That's the bit that got me there. One or two cells are removed from an embryo containing between six and nine or twelve cells. And initially I thought, gee, if they're taking two cells out of an eight cell embryo, uh, is any child that results going to be without legs or arms or, or whatever? Uh, but the architecture of the human body is fantastic. Uh, and stem cells are really quite clever little things. They work out exactly what's needed and produce the right number and the right quantity of those things to produce the complete human machine. Kelly, Kelly and Chris elected to use Melbourne IVF because it's a one-stop shop and they could do everything they needed to do at Melbourne IVF uh, the mandatory counselling, appointment with the IVF, fertility specialist, the mandatory appointment with the IVF counsellor to determine whether there's, in fact, the BGG is justified. Yeah. This, this is the process that Kelly and Chris went through. Uh, Kelly and Chris are both private people. Throughout the process, Liz and I felt, both felt great sympathy for them. The IVF process is invasive, it's public, it's time consuming, it has moments of great sadness, moments of great frustration, and it's not a good experience. Uh, but they chose to go through that um, to eliminate the 50-50 bet. There, there was no medical reason why Kelly and Chris couldn't have had children by the same process that we've always enjoyed since time began. But, but Kelly's had that 50-50 gamble that she'd pass the faulty X chromosome to a child. She's an engineer, she's not a gambler, and she chose to go through this process to eliminate that 
the chance. August 2004, November 2006. There's three mandatory one-off things there, counselling and test development, and then there were four cycles, which Kelly has quite neatly put on the slide there. It's a long process. Uh, there's sadness at those points. It's a costly process. Kelly and Chris didn't get any government assistance because this was something that they chose to do. I think my costs have far out, outweighed what these are. I've had cars modified, I've had wheelchairs, I've had mobility aids and things like that. There's, there's always advantages and disadvantages to these sorts of things. I'm a fairly simple-minded fellow uh, and initially I I thought that I was being edited out of my family tree. Um, I thought that by eliminating my X chromosome, my, my part of this child was going to be missing. Uh, of course, I was extremely proud of what they were doing and I loved the child when it came along, but I thought that I wasn't going to be part of it. And we like people looking at us and saying, you're like your father or you're like your grandfather or something like that. Uh, I've, I've, I've got some fairly smart friends and one of them has explained that my chromosome is only one of the 46 uh, chromosomes that go to make up the human being so I, and that lots of me was going to be passed down the line so I didn't feel so bad. But I was quite surprised initially until I got my head around the science uh, about the prospect of you know, this future child not being not being part of me. There he is. He's, he's lovely. He and his grandfather bond well uh, and we have a great time together. I see him regularly and uh, I'm so proud every time I look at him I almost weep after thinking what they've done. It, it's not an option that would suit everyone. I know there are people here with daughters who are in their teens and may have to think about Kennedys at some stage. It doesn't kill Kennedys, but I sleep very well every night in the knowledge that I'm the last person in my branch of my family who will ever suffer Kennedys disease.